The Basque country straddles the border between southwest France and northeast Spain. But except for their passports, the Basques are neither French nor Spanish. They are Basque. They speak the oldest European language still spoken. So old that no one can tell where it came from. We don't even know where the Basques came from. Scientific tests indicate that the Basques have a different bloodline than their neighbors in Spain and France. They also have a distinct and interesting culture, and they do all they can to keep their traditions alive. The Basques have lived on the Iberian Peninsula for thousands of years. But the two most important historic influences on Spain, a 300-year colonization by the ancient Romans and a 700-year occupation by the Moors, were hardly noticed by the Basques. The Basques lived in small, isolated villages and governed with a democracy in which the residents of a house voted as a unit rather than as individuals. That sense of family group has been central to their history. There are four Basque provinces in Spain and three just across the border in France. These days, the two most interesting cities for a tourist are San Sebastian and Bilbao. Since medieval times, Bilbao has been an important trading port. At first, the city shipped wool from the sheep farms of northern Spain. During the 1800s, iron mining became important and the city evolved into an industrial center for steel mills, shipbuilding, and chemical production. It was a commercial city and clearly not a destination for tourists. But that has completely changed. Today, Bilbao is Spain's fourth largest city and a major tourist attraction. For many travelers, the standard European tour, usually limited to London, Paris, and Rome, now includes Bilbao. The change was the result of imaginative urban planning and the belief that a single building could be the catalyst for the rebirth of an entire community. Because of its size, the Guggenheim Museum in New York can only present 5% of its collection at any one time. Yet the traditional model for a museum calls for it to constantly make new acquisitions, which just leads to more art in the storerooms. During the late 1980s, the board of directors of the Guggenheim Museum decided to continue its acquisition activities, but at the same time look for new sites to present their collection. They already had one in Venice, and they opened two new ones in New York City and one in Berlin. In 1991, they were negotiating with Salzburg, Austria, when the Basque government began making their pitch. And the Basque had a couple of good points. Salzburg already had a major international music festival, and hundreds of thousands of tourists came there every year. A Guggenheim Museum in Salzburg would just add more whipped cream to their cake. A Guggenheim Museum here could rejuvenate an entire city. The logic and the opportunity were too powerful for the Guggenheim to resist. The old shipyards became the site for the new museum with its titanium shell undulating in the wind and changing color from blue to red to gold throughout the day and night. Jeff Kuhn's flower-covered puppy welcomes visitors to the building, inviting them to loosen up for what's coming. About two hours before we got here, they decided to change the flowers on the puppy, so I, um, I had to show it to you in a postcard. But you get the idea. Fortunately, everything on the inside is ready for viewing. Our guide is Susana Garcia. In my tours, I usually like starting here, Andy Warhol, because I think this is quite different. This is not the Andy Warhol we were used to. I mean, this is what he was doing in the 50s. He was a graphic designer, and he was designing those shoes, you see. But from here, I personally, I can see his, the evolution he's going to have, because I can see the glamour already, and he's going to be obsessed with glamour. I can see the bright colors. I can imagine his assistant helping him to paint, to color, because he had what he called his coloring parties. And as he said, he wanted to be a sort of machine. He wanted to work in every media, cinema, photograph, painting. 
fashion, music, everything. He thought that everything could be art and art could become common. Tell me about this piece. Okay, this piece is by Jenny Holzer, an American artist, and she's working with language. So uh, what we're going to see is a text written in Spanish and in English, depending on the, on the moment you arrive. And well, she's playing with language because the message we get is a personal message, it's something intimate. But the media she's using is public. It's uh, LEDs. It's what we use for signage and advertising. That's it. Um, Contrast of a personal message in a public and media. That's it. Right. And something I like of this piece is that we can go through it and discover something else. Well, here we get a different color and a different language. It's in see. Basque. That's it. That's Basque language. Jenny Hauser had to come to Bilbao to prepare this piece. And well, when she came, she discovered Basque language. She didn't know anything about this. So she thought, well, that's perfect. As I had to come to Bilbao to discover this language, I want people to enter into my piece to discover my message in Basque. It's also a nice symbol because here, Basque is behind everything that we see up front. The Guggenheim jump-started the new Bilbao. The other great coastal city in Spain's Basque country is San Sebastian, which is about 50 miles to the east of Bilbao. The coast road between the two cities is beautiful. And the area has its own unique history. During the 1100s, the Catholic Church had three holy cities. Rome, Jerusalem, and Santiago de Compostelo on the northwest coast of Spain. If you visited any of these cities, the church would reduce the impact of your sins during your afterlife. It was called an indulgence. Getting to Jerusalem was dangerous and difficult. Getting to Rome was a lot easier, but when you got there, you weren't sure the church would give you an indulgence. Santiago de Compostelo was your best bet, and thousands of people made the trip every year, aided by the first travel guide for the mass market. It was written by a monk and published in 1130. It told you where the food was good or bad, where the neighborhoods were dangerous, and if there had been bathrooms, it would have told you which ones were clean. It was the mobile guide of the moment. The route passed through here, the town of Guitaria. And pilgrim or not, if you are traveling in the Basque country, Guitaria is worth a stop. It's the hometown of Juan Sebastian Elcano who was the navigator on Magellan's voyage around the world. Most popular literature describes Magellan as the first person to sail around the world, but he died in the Philippines and never finished the trip. It was Elcano who completed the voyage home and should be given credit for the trip. He got a nice statue, but he needed a better agent. Guitari is also the center for the production of a local wine called Chacoli, which is made from grapes grown on the nearby hills. Young, sparkling, and fruity, it is poured from a bottle held a few feet above the glass under the theory that the trip aerates the wine and increases its sparkle. Guitaria has a number of good restaurants that specialize in the outdoor grilling of fish that come up from the town's port. The grills are set up outside near the entrance to the restaurant. My favorite is Iribar. The chef's name is Pili, and she is the third generation of her family to own the restaurant. It's a perfect place to take a break during your pilgrimage. Following the Protestant Reformation, the market for indulgences pretty much disappeared, along with the traffic of pilgrims through Guitaria. But recently, there has been a resurgence. During the holy year 1993, over 100,000 pilgrims walk the route along northern Spain, and new hotels and inns are being built to accommodate the new traffic. To qualify as an authentic pilgrim, you must walk a minimum of 62 miles, but you can also meet the requirements by biking for 124. Inline skaters have made petitions, but as yet there is no official ruling. And if you're considering a skateboard, forget about it. You must start with a letter from your parish priest and a record book that gets stamped along the way. When you arrive in San Sebastian, you're entering a city that has been around since the 11th century and was one of the major resting points on the pilgrim route. 
But not much went on here until the middle of the 1800s when Queen Maria Cristina chose the beachfront waters of San Sebastian as the spot for her daughter's saltwater cure. Bathing in the ocean was recommended for the princess's skin ailment. But she didn't just walk into the water like you and I would today, because in 1845, decent people didn't swim in the ocean. You only went in the water if you fell in. You were usually a fisherman. <laughs> Gabriella Ranelli is an American friend of mine who has lived here since 1989 and has a good sense of the town. So what they had to do was build a special round building set on rails. It was called the Pearl of the Cantabrian. And the queen was in it, and a pair of oxen would pull it down into the water. She could very decorously lower herself into the water, swim around. Nobody would see the royal body. She was swimming inside yeah. this little no, she building. Would, she would come out. There was a hole in it. She could oh. swim out. She would swim around. You would see her head. The royal head would be there. Nobody would see the royal body. So she was OK. And then she would go back up into her, her little bathing house. The oxen would pull it on the beach, pull it up on the beach. She could bathe with fresh water, come out dressed with all of her dignity intact. And um, that's what people did in those days. Even though they wore bathing costumes made of wool from their necks down to their ankles, as you can see in photographs of the time. But because the queen was here, everybody else, all the court and all the aristocracy from Spain wanted to come up here and spend their summers at the same place where the queen came. That's an interesting point over there. That's a fortified wall. This was a walled city, of course. And that's where the French defended, generally the French, defended themselves against the English. Wellington and Napoleon were always fighting it out here. Because this was a very, very uh, strategic city. If you captured San Sebastian, you would generally have a gateway into the entire Iberian Peninsula and eventually Africa. So everybody wanted to this place. So they were always fighting people off. And eventually in 1813, uh, the English came in, the, the Allied troops came in, French had the city under siege and burned the entire thing to the ground. So they had to start over and rebuild. So a lot of what you're seeing is uh, the new 19th century city that they rebuilt after the fire and after the walls came down in 1865. The building right behind us, which is the town hall now, used to be the casino. It was built at the end of the 1800s, but then uh, gambling was outlawed in 1923, so they turned it into the town hall eventually. The gastronomy of San Sebastian is based on the sea and the mountains. The local chefs are considered to be some of the best in Europe, and seafood is one of their great strengths. Excellent fish soups, sea bream with garlic vinaigrette, or whatever today's catch is, fresh from the ocean and simply grilled. For hundreds of years, Basque fishermen followed whales across the Atlantic, eventually ending up off the coast of Newfoundland and discovering the huge schools of cod that live on the Grand Banks. Many historians believe that the Basques knew a great deal about the New World long before Columbus showed up, but didn't tell anybody about it because they considered it a commercial advantage. And it makes perfectly good sense. If you found gold, why would you want to tell the competition where your mine is? And cod turned out to be a gold mine for the Bosques. Dried cod was a way of preserving valuable nutrients and became a popular food throughout Europe. The demand for cod increased when the Catholic Church required meatless meals, and the Bosques were the major suppliers. Today, codfish is an essential ingredient in the local flavors of the Bosques. But cod is not the only important fish in the Bosque kitchen. Walk through the market in the city of San Sebastian, and you will see the other local favorites. Langoustine, which is a European species of lobster. Monkfish, tuna, hake, sardines, and anchovies. Because Basque country is as much about mountains as it is about the sea, lamb has always been an important part of the local cuisine. The mountains behind San Sebastian are home to the sheep herders, whose traditional dishes include roast lamb with garlic and lemon, served with roasted potatoes and hearts of lettuce. But there are also some small ranches that supply great steaks. The sheep also supply milk, which is used to make a number of traditional Basque cheeses. The cheeses take on the flavor of the mountain plants on which the sheep fed. In the United States, you can find a number of Basque cheeses. The Basques are also famous for their hams. The mountain forests filled with acorns and chestnuts became a natural habitat for the pigs, and ham is an essential part of the Basque diet. 
The little upside down umbrellas are there to catch any drippings. The local flavors of the Basque kitchen reflect the history of the region. Ancient Romans did little trading with the Basque and introduced wheat, olive oil, and winemaking, which was rather important since all three elements are essential to one of the great gastronomic traditions of the Basque, a tradition known as the Pincho Bar. Let's go into this bar, which is the place that I've had breakfast in almost every day for the last 10 years. Okay, this is a Pincho Bar, where they have, uh, Pinchos are little snacks, they're called tapas and the rest is same. But here, uh, this is a breakfast one, it's a little bit different from the ones uh, people go to in the evening, which are heartier. Mm. And normally, you know, if you come here all the time, usually you come stumbling in, they'll hand you the newspaper first thing in the morning. They know what everybody likes to eat. Everybody has their favorite pincho usually. And um, they know their clients. So he's, ha he's pouring some chocolate, which is a sparkling, uh, well, it's a local wine. It's a white wine, which they pour from a great height, so it gets a little effervescent. It's not a sparkling wine. It's made with grapes, which are grown on steep hills next to the sea. So they don't get a lot of sun. They get a lot of rain. It's quite tart, but it's, a, it's an aperitif. It's an aperitif, yeah. These are great. It's just an egg omelet on a little piece little of roll bread. With ham. with ham. Very simple, but it's absolutely ideal. I want one mm. of those. That's a Hilda. Hilda. <laughs> Why is it called a Hilda? Well, it's actually, in English, we'd probably say Gilda. It was after the Rita Hayworth film, which, oh, which uh, okay. had a lot of impact here. So it's anchovies, Spicy. little peppers, and olives on a toothpick. Mm -hmm. Rita. Every bar has its own version of that. Rita Hayworth. Yes, like Rita oh. Hayworth. Spicy. They do a Rita was considered spicy. Yeah, here, that, that scene where she takes off her glove, they, you know, that revolutionized the entire country. Uh -huh. I don't see the bagel, but I definitely see the smoked salmon and the cream cheese. Mm -hmm. You take whatever you want, and at the end, we just tell them what we've had, and they'll tell us how much it is. They're very good at math. So, mm. it's the honor system. And people are very honest. Nobody cheats on pinch -up. At night, the pincho bars take on a different menu and a different character. Groups of friends come together, forming a loose assembly of like-minded pincho lovers. They know what they like to eat, and they know where they like to eat it. They have a pre-planned route, and they move along it. One team that I traveled with always starts at 8 o'clock on Thursday nights at a specific bar. They go there because they like the mushrooms. After about 30 minutes, they move on to the next place. If you miss the 8 o'clock opening, you know where to catch up at 8.30, and that will be true for the third or fourth spots as the night continues. You gotta pace yourself, too. That's why the wines are so small, also. Ah, Big glass. that's right. Big, Big glass, glass a little, little bit, bit of wine. Because you might have to go to 20 bars. And so if you were drinking an enormous tankard full of wine, you would make it past four. Also, one of the nice things about this is it gives a lot of room on the top for air, which means you get a better flavor from the wine. Shall we? The streets of San Sebastian's old city are packed with pincho groups moving from bar to bar. This is where we're going. Okay? Now you can always tell the best pincho bars because they've got the most people in them. This place is jumping. Yeah. Wow. You gotta kind of elbow your way in here. It's a time honored tradition. So this restaurant is very well known for seafood. Uh -huh. It's an excellent seafood restaurant. What's this? These are the baby eels, which come down from the mountains. We have to eat them with a wooden fork. And stir them around. Stir them, give them a quick stir. The reason you use a wooden fork is also because if you use the metal fork, the eels would obviously slip through it. So they come from the Saragasso Sea. Nobody knows where they go after that. They travel here. They get here, they're about three years old. They're this little. It's like pasta. Well, yeah. But you didn't tell me Very they were expensive big. pasta, though, let me tell you. How much is that? Um, they cost about $500 a kilo. $500 for two and a quarter pounds. That's the traditional food that they eat on the day of San Sebastian, the 20th of January. And I want to finish every eel <laughs> in this bowl. I'm going to try them. Right. At $250 a pound, this is serious stuff. Delicious. Now, one of the things they have here, one of the special things they have is our goose barnacles. Uh, yeah, goose? Yeah. Goose barnacles? Yeah, they're not laid by geese. Geese they're... get barnacles? I mean, they move around a lot. I was surprised. Goose barnacles. It's a, it's a specialty here that most places in the world they don't eat. They're big barnacles. Let's order some. And I think we should have some wine because... Uh... Wine, wine is good. Wine goes with goose barnacles, you know what I mean? Is there a particular wine that you drink with goose barnacles? Here's some goose barnacles. They're no, hot. I'm actually quite full. I, I, I just 
I don't know if I have any room left for a goose barnacle. Let's wait on the goose barnacle. Do I have room for a goose barnacle? Yeah, I have room. I think that um, the best way to eat the goose barnacles is sort of, uh, well, warm. I wouldn't eat them this hot because it's oh, such no. a subtle flavor. Yes. But I think it's right. Why don't you finish your eels? Oh, eels are fine. The eels are okay. We're going to need these. We're going to need these, actually, because eating goose barnacles can be a little messy. So keep, oh, keep yeah. one handy. Okay, so I think that looks like a good one. Oh, this looks like a wonderful goose barnacle. Now what do I do? All right. Find a good spot, like there, between the nail and the body, and kind of pull it open. You have to use your nail to get, get your nail in there and, and twist it open. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. I don't have to eat it. <laughs> no. All right. Um, uh, obviously, this is this not is, one that, of that my talents. A, that was a defective barnacle, obviously. A defective <laughs> barnacle, I feel. Okay, so you've opened one. There you go. And I just kind of like to eat it. Just eat, don't eat the nail. Just no eat the, sauce. Eat the fleshy so part. Just no, no, no. Like the whole it's, it's just they're cooked in seawater for one minute. I gotta get the kind of barnacle juice off myself. And they're good. They're subtle. Kind of like the eel. Like a snail. They're a great delicacy right. here. Not a first date kind of food. You know, they're really very good. Yeah. All right, it's well, time to pay up and ship out. <laughs> this is my treat. Hold on. Sorry, I left it. I didn't finish all the goose barnacles. <laughs> Another traditional aspect of Basque gastronomy is the cider house. The Basques have been growing apples for thousands of years and making cider since medieval times. At some point, a farmer decided to sell his excess capacity and thought it would be a good idea to let everybody have a taste just after the fermentation. They brought along something to eat, and before you knew it, the tradition of cider tasting was part of gastronomy in the Basque region. And cider houses developed all over the area. The cider houses became centers of social life. During the cider tasting season, which runs from late January through March, the traditional cider houses open up and people stand around tasting cider. During the rest of the year, they're closed. But here in San Sebastian, there's a restaurant called Sideria Donestiara, which is open all year round and has an atmosphere that is very much in keeping with the old farmhouse tasting rooms. One big space, long wooden tables without tablecloths, an open kitchen, grilled food, vats of cider along the walls, and patrons filling their glasses with the traditional cider catching technique. The process for making apple cider is basically the same process used for making wine with uh, apples sitting in for the grapes. There's a natural yeast on the crushed apples that turns the sugar in the apples into carbon dioxide gas and alcohol. The carbon dioxide gas makes the cider bubbly and the um, alcohol <laughs> makes the cider. There is a standing menu in the cider house. First, slices of cod omelet and a green salad. The main course is grilled steak. For dessert, slices of local cheese, strips of quince jelly, and walnuts. And of course, as much cider as you want. <laughs> For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, bertwolf.com.